Hi, this is Zach. And this is Patrick. And welcome to Pipecast. Where we pipe up for pipes and pipe down for what? Well, it's finally a good day. Finally. It's like 62 degrees tomorrow. And sunny all day, blue skies. February 2nd, Groundhog's Day. Is he supposed to see his shaddy or not? I think he will see it, which means more winter, I think. You know what he hadn't seen? What's that? This star of the east I'm smoking on. I'm sure he had not What are you smoking now? Smoking it in this black uh, billiard, the Peterson Dublin edition. Hmm. And yeah, how's it going with it? I like it. It's a, it's a slightly bigger bowl than my other ones. So it's a, we're in for a long night. What about you? Smoking Bob's Chocolate Flake by Gawith and Hogarth. Uh, in a uh, skull meerschaum, which has been serving me pretty well since I've had it. Yeah, I think you were smoking on it last week. Mm-hmm. So I'm a little, a little precious with my briar pipes here lately. I don't know why, but I just I haven't been too keen on smoking them. <clears throat> I feel like they just need to be uh, kept away for a little while. Yeah. Because I've just been smoking basically this meerschaum. I smoked... Uh, did I smoke any briar this week? I got a bones pipe this week, so I smoked out of that. That's right. With that little, I got a little stubby pot. It's kind of like a workhorse, no bit, chew on it, it's light, I don't care what I do with it kind of pipe. I don't care to the point that I accidentally set it in, I was cooking chicken, and the way I usually cook chicken is in a cast iron skillet. And, uh, use olive oil. And uh, I just packed a pipe, and I went to check on the chicken real quick, and I was going to tell my wife to finish up. And I sat down the pipe to look at the chicken, and turned around and grabbed something, and then looked, and I'd set the pipe right into some spilt olive oil, so it speckled the back, the underside of the shank and the bottom of the bowl. And uh, I was like, well, I guess I'm committed now, so I just oiled the rest of the pipe in olive oil. So now it's this dark color. But it's stained well. I mean, I kind of like it, but it's just like, well, I wasn't expecting, planning to do that, but here we go. Because it had a nice, just unfinished look to it. Now it looks like it's professionally stained. Yeah, total accident, too. Well, it's good, because if it would have turned out bad, I would have probably been upset. But I mean, I guess it really doesn't matter. It's not a very expensive pipe. It smokes well enough for me. Something to kind of do while you're messing around in the shop or out for like a long walk. When you were fishing or something like that. It'd just be something to do when you don't exactly want to keep up with your pipe. Yeah. I'll probably get one one day. Because they seem nice. And little stubby guys. And, you know, like you said, a no worries kind of pipe. But, um, so I think last time we spoke, we mentioned a couple things. One of the things was um your licorice yep so so i don't know if you guys know this but um recently i bought i bought some lakeland tobaccos and uh, one of them was brown licorice flake now four weeks ago uh four weeks in a day i took some full virginia flake and stoved it and then i made uh anise uh seed and licorice extract and coated the uh the flakes with it and then steamed it and stoved and then i, I resprayed the uh the leaves or the flakes and then let them sit for about four weeks just in a container kind of closed off to kind of let them rehydrate and everything so last night i was going to do the opening of the stove virginias and smoke that and then compare it to um, the brown licorice flake and see how they played out so i smoked uh my stove last night i'd already been smoking on the brown licorice and i can tell you this like i don't know what it is about virginia but any type of traditional or black cavendish that's wet enough and it has some sort of flavoring component to it will just just completely annihilate your tongue <laughs> I have had the worst tongue bite. I didn't even want to smoke today, really? to be honest with you, because it's just been just lingering. I don't know if whatever I created 
uh, kind of like a sugary concoction, concoction really amped up everything last night. But I went to bed and I couldn't taste anything. And I woke up this morning and I was like, huh, eggs don't taste like anything still. And uh, it's it's sort of slowly come back. I mean, it's not like the end of the world. I've had probably worse things as far as tongue bites concerned. But man, like it was just. You, you really wouldn't want you you mean like you know i try not to smoke super puff style but i was kind of a a steady gust coming in on me and i think it was actually helping really keep the smoke bellowing <laughs> and uh i really struggled uh with the tongue bite like kind of as i was smoking my stove virginia i if i could you know today with no breeze just you know calm would have been a perfect day to smoke this or test it out. But I guess in anticipation, I, I really tried to uh, get everything smoked and, you know, so some things jotted down. So um, I can tell you the difference between the brown licorice uh, from God with and Hogarth and my stove uh, is that the, the, as far as tasting is concerned. Neither of them really, I guess licorice really doesn't have a very pronounced, you know, flavor. I mean, like, it's like, it's almost like not even there in either one of them. As soon as you spray it on, it must evaporate. I mean, I guess you have to spray it going into the bowl if you really want to taste some licorice flavoring. Because I couldn't taste it in either one. But the Stowe Virginia's had a much more potent, like, bread yeasty flavor to it after i because i put it in the oven and stove at 199 or 200 degrees for about four hours and then um yeah i, I would assume you know the kind of low heat kind of like stoving process i mean they're very dark the the virginias i'd put into the tin to stove versus what i took out of the oven uh the difference is crazy you know the uh the you know this light kind of light to dark brown to this basically super super dark flake and then of course brown licorice flake uh is just brown so yeah um not i it, it's sort of like a success only in that like i can't take the taste of licorice from the other i also had some peter stokeby's uh what is it called? Oh, I can't remember. It's what pe people compare it to Orlick, uh, Dark Kentucky. Oh. But it's uh, it's Peter's, not Stokeby's, actually, it's Peter Heinrich's um, Kentucky Blend. And uh, it supposedly has some treacle slash molasses slash licorice flavoring in it. And it's very, it's not, it's, it's hidden, basically. And that's a, uh, that's almost where it kicked off because I did Peter uh, Heinrichs. Maybe it's Petra Heinrichs. But uh, and I got tongue bite from that. So it's like something in just a super stout Virginia or something. Or maybe it's just a way I smoke. Maybe like all three nights were super windy or something. Do you think if you had... Or I guess, would you use a different type of tobacco to coat the licorice? Instead of Virginia. Virginia is so sweet. I wouldn't want to sweeten in anything that is purposely not supposed to be sweet. Mm. Well, that's just my opinion. Now, granted, well, I mean, like, I guess all I've been smoking are really Lakeland tobaccos. Like, Innerdale, uh, Bob's Chocolate Flake, Brown Licorice, uh, and then... That's kind of what I've been smoking. And then, of course, those are just really the taste. Um, I predominantly smoke vapor blends. So mm. I'm on the I'm on the kick right now of smoking. Uh, well, we'll talk about that some other yeah. time. But I'm in the midst of a, of a planned topic for the next discussion. Uh, kind of squaring off two tobaccos that are oftentimes compared and just my kind of general impressions of both of them yeah yeah um most of my week was um trying out uh like we said last week i, I got a bunch of component blends 
And uh, so this time, uh, this week, to start it all off, I went with Bright Virginias. Um, and I got a couple of notes down about my experience with Bright Virginia. Now, once I, this, this upcoming week I will do Red Virginias, and then I'll probably take a break, and because uh, I have a blend, I believe it is uh, Red Carpet, which is red and, uh, it's either Red Carpet or Opening Night. It's two, two Cornell and Dill that I got free with uh, when I purchased these pipes. One of them is just uh, red and bright Virginias. So I want to compare how it was smoking just bright Virginias and just red Virginias and then having them mixed. Now, there may be some kind of casing or something on it, on the uh, red carpet or whatever it is that has both, but I just want to compare. But my uh, essential thoughts on uh, on the bright Virginias are... Um, uh, the smells was very figgy-ish to me, uh, out of the bag. Um, but uh, it, it sort of had a, a coffee, nutty aftertaste. And sort of clove. I got a little bit of clove-like uh, taste in there. A real stingy, peppery retro hell. It was a real light smoke. It wasn't real puffy, billowy at all. Uh, it stayed lit, but it burnt hot. It, it, I mean, it was hot um, the whole time, and I mean, I, I, I usually don't uh, burn them hot. I mean, it, it, I'm pretty pretty conscious about my cadence, but um, no, that's that's really. I mean, so I mean, I, I enjoyed the Bright Virginia. I mean, it 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 was almost like smoking an aromatic in a way. Had a light smoke. Uh, didn't have a lot, um, didn't have a lot of body to it. It was just, I mean, it was just a smoke, really. Um, well, normally, we'd be doing a pipe of the week on this segment, but it seems like you can't get anyone to use that hashtag, and I'm not 100% sure what the weekly pipe is without going through people's feeds and looking for it. So, kind of a friendly reminder if you're listening, if you want to be pipe of the week with little competition... Uh, definitely use that uh, hashtag, and that's hashtag uh, Pipecast P-O-T-W. P-O-T-W. Pipecast P-O-T-W. I think we always link it in every one of our posts, so it's going to be, I guess, no Pipe of the Week this week, because we kind of want you guys to utilize the uh, the old hashtag, just so we know who's posting what pipes and we don't have to start filtering through feeds looking for something specific. But uh, but uh, I've seen some pretty pipes. I see you guys posting them. I know you're proud of them, so definitely uh, give us a little uh, shout out in that and uh, we'll definitely mention you. Um, we're trying to get a little competition going. That way we can kind of pick and choose what we think is the most uh, beautiful pipe that we get uh, displayed for the week. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of good good ones out there. Um, yeah, pipes, uh, they're beautiful. I love them. I love the way they are. That's a reference to one of our fans who let us know that he enjoys the dialogue so much, and he only makes me question the way I speak every time I speak to him. So, yeah. If you have if you have any questions, remember our, uh, our email is um, pipecast256 at gmail.com. So if you want to let us know, how you like the way we sound, uh, or if you don't like the way we sound, please email us. Email us. We want to hear from you so we can question the way we say certain things off the cuff. It's great. <laughs> so here's something we're trying to do. Try to connect with the community a little bit more outside of at least pipe smoking because I mean, we all know that we love that. But uh, we also enjoy reading from time to time. You know, I, mean, I, re- I guess... Patrick and I both read quite a bit, but um, what we'd like to do is sort of kind of, uh, if you guys would be interested, making a, uh, maybe kind of a reading club uh, out of this podcast, where we can talk a little bit, discuss a little bit of the books. As a matter of fact, it's one of the things I was thinking about as a segment, where um, we could list off uh, essentially some of the chapters that we want to read, and uh, you know, we, we get suggestions for a book, 
we select the book and then we break out our uh, our pipe cast here into sections or chapter sections that we discuss weekly so if you want to tune in while you're reading we'll discuss what we read how we like it and then we can take some questions from the gmail account uh or instagram, instagram and see uh see some people's inputs or some questions or what we thought about different things obviously spoilers would probably be you know there would need to be a spoiler alert maybe but uh uh if you guys would be interested in reading and we're talking about fantasy science fiction fiction history philosophy uh send in uh, your requests and we will uh you know we'll take it in your favorite books we'd be interested in reading and It'd be an interesting thing to break down the section to kind of see what the pipe community is reading. So if you are interested right now, we just we just recently started a novel called Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. Yeah. Uh, sorry. A little fuzzy with this author's name. It's a pretty popular series. It's supposedly going to be a trilogy. I know the second book is out, but the third one hasn't happened yet. So I think he has a writer's book. Really? He's pretty been up, pretty open about it. Oh, one of our uh, fans, I was talking to him about it, and he was thinking that he may um, may have suffered uh, something very similar to what J. R. R. Mar- or George R. R. Martin has suffered, uh, reading too many of the fan theories and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Sometimes I can, I can see where that could hurt you a little bit. It's best to... Well, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know how it is to write a series, obviously. I can't say, but I would assume that you would have some of it at least laid out. Seems like it'd be a little dangerous just to not have it laid out. I mean, they can make the TV show go on and have it concluded, but they don't. You know, I mean, what is he going to be more comfortable after the TV show's concluded, or is he just going to change it? Huh. Yeah, I don't know. But so far, I'm, I'm liking The Name of the Wind. Mm-hmm. I'm about 100 pages in. Um, and, uh, so far it's really, it's, it's, what I enjoy about it is, I'm not, I'm not going to give anything away, but the story is about somebody telling a story, pretty much, and I like how the author has been able to change his writing style very well to, instead of him telling a story now, it's his character telling a story, and he seems, because... One thing I've noticed is I like the way the, the actual author writes. I like the way he, he um, does it. And if it was if the whole book was like the way his character tells stories, I probably uh, wouldn't like it. But because it's part of the story, you know, I'm okay with it, if, if that makes sense. Like, uh, the person telling the story is someone who's known to be an embellisher. That's just part of his, his uh, upbringing and things like that. So he's the way he talks is a little bit repetitive, things like that. And so, if I was reading a book and that's how the author actually wrote the story, I'd probably be a little perturbed. But because it's the author writing a character telling a story, you know, I understand the, the context of it. Mm-hmm. So, I like how how he can he changes it. Like it feels like it's two different people completely telling different stories. But I enjoy, I'm enjoying it a lot. It's kind of set up like, I think it's called an epistolary, which is sort of like, granted it's not, because it's not through tweets or letters or, you know, kind of the way like Frankenstein or World War Z was uh, set up, but like, in that you're being told the story as it's being chronicled by someone else. I think that's interesting that they have that whole aspect of um, who takes on the myth who takes on the fable and who makes sure that that becomes eternal and not just the spoken word itself yeah yeah because that's a big deal uh as far as the history of humanity um until something is elevated to the written word it isn't quite immortal yeah and it's it's subject to um to alterations mm-hmm. the um even written word is subject to alteration it can be. Because I could read something two years ago, three years ago, slightly misremember it, and then tell somebody about it, and then they tell somebody about it. And n- n- neither one of them ever reads it. They just remember me telling them about mm-hmm. it. So. 
it's a strange how the mind works. You just sort of develop this idea about something that isn't, and then sell it that way for the rest of your life. There's probably a thousand endings to Jaws if you're just hearing it from someone who maybe caught the end of a TBS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of, I'm, I'm assuming it's in the same area of the mind where we get the Mandela effect. Probably. Do you want to explain the Mandela effect? I'd rather you do it. All right. So the Mandela effect is when, specifically when uh, kind of a, a large group of people misinterpret a um, an event or in a um, the, name of something. the name of something or just um, it, it gets its effect because a lot of people thought they saw the body of Nelson Mandela uh, pulled out of prison that he was dead and that uh, they just remember him being dead for some reason even though he went on to and this was in the 80s so I mean he went on to become the president of South Africa but that's where it gets its name from but I mean other weirder things uh, if you guys remember reading the children's story the Baron Stain Bears some people remember it being the Baron Steen Bears like I think the difference is it's spelling S-T-A-N-E yeah. or S T. E I N. Uh, most people think it's S T E I N. Yeah. It's actually Stain. I think A N E. The Baron Stain Bears. So uh, there's a, another one where people think that Sinbad was in a movie about being a genie in the yeah. 90s. They're probably. Thinking about Shaq. Shaq. I think Shaq was in a movie called Kazam. Yeah, and like a lot of people swear up and down that they had, they had the VHS tape of Sinbad. Mm -hmm. being in something that one's actually a little bit more peculiar because i believe <coughs> i heard uh on um dan cummings podcast time suck he went into detail about this effect and i believe he was saying that there was actually supposed to be talks of sinbad being in a movie but they never happened so it, it adds a little bit to it so it but it's still you know how could somebody claimed that they owned a movie that never was made and then there's um definitely the uh, uh sick in the city mm -hmm. reference a lot of people well, I, I, I now i can't remember which one's which it's a i think people think it's sex in the city and, and it's, it's actually sick. sex and yeah the city yeah and and uh the only reason why i thought that it was what it really was which is sex and the city is because uh in the town or the the area that me and zach grew up in they have a music festival a jazz festival every year and one, and they always had t-shirts with different sayings in it and one year it said uh sax in the city <laughs> on the shirts and i was like no oh, sax in the city and um i believe you're the one that told me about the darth vader one Mm -hmm. where it's uh it's not luke i am your father it's no it's no i am your father yeah a lot of people miss miss do that one and they probably misinterpret it because it gets quoted so randomly because i mean it doesn't make sense if you're trying to do that impression and say no i am your father yeah it actually makes more sense to break it down uh the most memorable one to me, it was in Tommy Boy when Chris Farley said, Luke, I am your father. Mm. Um, so, you know, kind of a weird thing. Um, the weird thing about the Mandela effect is is that it's it's uh, supposedly a, um, a split memory from a separate dimension. A dimension in which Sinbad was a genie, or he really did say, Luke, I am your father, or really was sex in the city. <laughs> um, that's the ongoing theory that we're we are having some sort of relapse memory of an alternate dimension that actually happened. Hmm. I'm not 100% sure how I would gather a memory from an alternate dimension. Uh, but I don't know. That could also... Hey, it's 2012. We're all dead. Oh, God. It could also play in the... I mean, you could throw deja vu into that. Because deja vu could be... You know, you could say in an alternate reality some things still happen the way it did and if you're sort of deja vu that about the time it happened then, mm -hmm. not the time it happened now. <laughs> right. That could be something. Deja vu's weird, dude. Like, it can scare you. Because, like, it, well, it gets me because it's, 
it happens in, I don't know, I've never heard it this way, but this is sort of how I feel. It happens and you get a weird sensation of comfortableness. And then all of a sudden, it's almost like it gets pulled away from you. And you're like, because I guess it, it's almost like a meta moment to yourself. You get real comfortable. And then all of a sudden, you pull out and you're like, wait a minute. Did I, didn't I do this? Did this happen once before? I remember this happening. And, you know, may never have happened. Mm. Um, that's how it feels for me. It's just weird. I never feel comfortable about it. I always like snap back like this has been done before and I'm about to yeah. say this thing and then I say it and then I'm like hmm mm, yeah. and I'm now discomfortable. Yeah. One thing I guess uh, where I get the comfortable stuff is uh, I, I am prescribed Adderall so nobody think I'm you know some gunky or something I don't know. But when I take an Adderall <laughs> did, what? I've been getting those emails all week, but I think Patrick's a junkie. Oh, well, now you know. For all you out there, you know, no, I'm not. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> no, uh, whenever I take one and I, you know, you get into that zone, it's like a comfortable zone. Like, like, and then the same kind of thing happens with deja vu. All of a sudden, I become aware of my comfortability and, uh, or my comfortableness. And, uh, then you're like, well, I wish I could get back to that. Then you just got to keep working, and it'll, eventually it'll come back. Do you think maybe you weren't comfortable, but it was just heightened awareness? And then that you eased into that thought that maybe you're just comfortable, but really you're just heightened, heightened aware, height, more height, you have more awareness, I suppose, a more heightened awareness of the stuff that you're doing? Mm, I don't know. Because it, it for sure makes me think I'm comfortable. It's really like, like it's almost like I could do that all day long. That's how nice it feels mm. to, to to be in that moment. It's interesting. But um, but no, um, sort of. We chase some rabbit there. You should give name of the one to try. Yeah, if you guys would like, you can uh comment on instagram or send us a little gmail and uh we can start breaking this up into chapters and reading them during the week because this is kind of how we spend our piping and leisure time and uh we can tell you how many chapters we're going to read and that's what we'll discuss specifically if you'd like and then obviously if you have recommendations for another book uh we'll take it down and uh, purchase the book and read it and discuss it yeah yeah <clears throat> so, to round out things, I was thinking, there for a little bit, you and I were running kind of experiments on uh, different lighters and their effects on tobacco. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, I know that you've settled with a Zippo here recently, which is know. one of the lighters that gets the most backlash yes. from smokers um, because of that kind of you know, fuel flavor that enters the tobacco. Yeah. And uh, I know most uh, most pipe smokers will swear to a, a soft flame butane lighter, um, like an old boy Corona or a DuPont or a Peterson lighter. Um, and then some people uh, go with a Zippo. Uh, others will go with a Bic. And then, of course, there's the, uh, like I think I already said, the tried and true match. So, we've been smoking different things. Um, I'm going to have to reference me using a soft flame butane. Back in the day, I don't use one anymore, but I used to, so I can kind of tell you. But uh, if you'd like, we can kind of comment on what you think the best uh, best way to light your pipe is uh, going through. Because you've, you've used the majority of them except for a butane, I'm assuming. Yes, I haven't used a butane, but, um, no, I, uh, I was first, you know, I was thinking about the Zippo, and then, um, you let me borrow one, and I was, uh, open it up, and I, you know, turned the wheel, and I smelt it, you know, I could smell it right away, and I was like, I don't think I'm gonna like this at all, 
if I can smell it already. But, uh, you know, I gave it a shot. And it was, uh, tried it in a corn cob first, uh, of course. And um, I didn't notice it at all. It, this, the only thing I ever notice is the smell when I open, the, open it and then light it. I, I smell it then. I put it on the tobacco and it doesn't, it doesn't transfer it to me. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's my youthfulness in the pipe game, but it, it doesn't give any kind of added effect to me at all. So uh, I, I would definitely say if you're interested, you should try it because you never know. Some people will smell it. Some people can taste it. Some people can't. I do think having a, there's something kind of part of that accoutrement of uh, carrying a lighter with you kind of uh, kind of harkens back to the days of old um, mm -hmm. and I can go through kind of my list uh, starting out with the matches I think that's probably the most traditional way to light yeah. um, I think a lot of people use the swan matches which uh, I think I gave you a pack of just to try it out so um, I like swan I think they're good matches uh, the problem matches to me, or they're so they're just they're so inconvenient mm -hmm. when you, if you're not in a a space where you can block the wind. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I usually can kind of block up and kind of cover, give you get some cover. But if it's pretty windy, uh, even even if you're not right in direct wind line, it's going to be really difficult to get everything set up because there's two lights to every pipe. There's the uh, initial and then the true light that's, and uh, yeah. that's the biggest thing against matches for me and that can really cause you a lot of headache if you're trying to do that with matches because you want to round the bowl and then there's a lot of if you smoke meerschaum pipes too uh match ends have a tendency to char the rim of the bowl of course you're going to get some rim charming regardless in my you know from my experience uh you can be extra careful but at the end of the day you're probably going to get some unless you use yeah something kind of to to knock that down I, I tend to find that i always get some form of rim charring on any pipe that i use but um i like matches i don't think that they really carry a taste with them as long as you burn off some of that sulfur when you strike it or some of that red phosphorus when you strike it you let it burn for a little bit to kind of get off some of that taste uh the next one is my personal favorite which is a bic i think it's the most convenient slash uh it leaves no flavoring in it whatsoever. No I can't taste anything afterwards. Um, uh, I don't think uh, I don't think it, it gets any more convenient. Uh, maybe that's because I'm a cigarette smoker and like it's just so con it's so different in general. But I have no problem lighting my pipe with a bic. I have no problem continuing to smoke with a bic, and I get no flavor uh, from. A big lighter or just a regular fluid lighter the only problem I've had some people don't have it the only problem I've had with a big is similar to the match in the wind it almost seems like I can't cover up like I can't get the perfect block to get that thing to go mm. but you are right on all other accounts I mean the it's the most convenient doesn't leave a taste. I mean, I'm usually using a Bic or a Zippo. I'm pretty guarded with my Bics. Kind of is like years of practicing to try to light something uh, while you're outside. You can, I mean, cigarette smokers are are hated so thoroughly. They're the dregs of society, you know. The vitriol that they bring with them is... is a lot so um trying to get outside and take a quick smoke and like fight the elements and just fight evil glares like you learn to be pretty efficient with lighting a cigarette so i can sort of take that experience and add it to my ability to light with a, uh, a pipe with a big um but that's my i think that's the most convenient it's small it's quick it's efficient now that's what i think now moving on to the zippo lighter uh like i said man the fuel content when you open that thing up that wick is just sopping with lighter fluid and it just boom right in the face it just mm. out of the as soon as you hear that 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 little ding sound 
Nice. You know, you just blam right in your face. You smell all of that lighter fluid up until you light it and then close it. Um, super convenient. Um, we use a uh, Zippo pipe lighter, which actually has the center portion completely cut out of it. So you can hover it over your bowl uh, horizontally as opposed to a normal um, Zippo, which uh, you would have to kind of invert, which is super inconvenient. Yeah. Um, I do know that they make inserts, thanks to Patrick, for Zippo lighters that uh, create a soft flame for pipes where you can actually do a soft butane. I don't know if it's refillable or not, though, is it? Yeah, it is. Okay, so, yeah. but it's probably plastic, I'm sure. It's probably yeah. not as costly, but if you do have a, if you do have kind of a, a, a love of the Zippo aesthetic and a hatred of the fuel, you can actually get, uh, I think they call it Thunderbird? Or? Yeah, it's a Thunderbird insert. Yeah, the, the top portion looks identical almost to a, uh, to a, uh, to the Zippo pipe insert, except when you pull it out, the bottom part isn't uh, metal with an opening on the bottom. It's just a, a plastic container. But I'm trying to think. Uh, there is a little difference. See on the on the Zippo pipe lighter, there's a hole all the way through on both sides. I believe on the Thunderbird insert, there's only a hole on one side. And it's probably because that fuel, that butane fuel. Uh, is maybe it needs to be some more guard, some more wind guard on it, and and uh, and also the the nozzles sort of angled, so it comes out sort of at an angle outside of the hole, mm. and then also the cool thing about it is the what's this thing called the the camp or whatever the, the uh, I'm not 100 percent sure what that's called, whatever the heck it is, the thing that flips it open that that keeps the the top of the zippo off on a thunderbird insert it also serves the purpose of releasing the the butane, the butane. yeah now to get back to the regular zippo before we go in full headlong into butane uh fuel uh I, i'll talk about zippo and lighter fluid um i can taste it i do think it's marginal uh it kind of depends on how sensitive you are to flavoring maybe i've just been around the block and it doesn't really bother me that much i think it burns off fairly quickly i think as soon as you light it too and you kind of let it sit for a little bit uh it, it eventually becomes uh unnoticeable if you let it burn for just a second i mean if you don't just flip it strike it and immediately light your bowl you let it kind of maybe just kind of have like a little stare off of the flame and then light it i think it burns off a lot of that excessive fuel very me, similar to the match. Yeah, but it's a uh, it's marginal. I don't I don't taste it as much. It's weird. I do taste it a lot in cigars. Like I would never light a cigar with the Zippo ever. Um, mm. For some reason, it just lingers. But uh, you know, I think it's marginal with a pipe. Um, I, I'm sure people have more sensitivity to it than I do, and and it probably ruins their smoking experience. So, you know, kind of buyer beware. I would definitely do a taste test on a cob in case you're afraid that some of that that uh, lighter fluid might ghost a little bit um but as far as uh butane just kind of get to a butane so like an old boy corona zycar uh dupont or maybe a peterson and i think there's some other like kind of cheaper versions online that you can get they usually range anywhere from 50 dollars uh at kind of the low end and then um you're you're going 50 to 60 that's you know pretty normal low end you can get up to about 120 130 when you hit the peterson corona market yeah uh and then when you get to the dunhill dupont you're looking at like eight to nine hundred dollars maybe even more depending on what finish and things you really want uh i don't i don't 100 percent know why you would require a letter outside of just like a statement sort of a fashion statement i do know that uh dunhill and dupont are i think dupont's french um i think they're both swiss designed and they're all brass interior so it's a little like if you sort of break into your coronas and your petersons they they will some of them i don't quote me but some of them will have plastic um 
reservoirs where the butane's held. But I know that's not the case with like a DuPont or a Dunhill. They're all brass interior, all like kind of Swiss watchmaker made. So that's probably where your cost is coming from since it's Swiss design. Um, and I guess people are going to pay more for prestige. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think you can get a dollar twenty-five, dollar eighty-nine lighter at the gas station with a little bick and a little guy on the side, uh, and that's really going to cover your bases uh, thoroughly. Now, that's just my opinion, but that's I do believe that'll thoroughly cover you without having to get really into it. Matches are cheap. Basically, all matches strike the same, in my opinion. Just let them burn off. Um, I don't care if it's a bar cardboard match tab or a um, a box of Swan. I, I prefer Swan just because I think they're a little bit more robust of a, of a match. But, I mean, you're not really getting anything different. I usually keep a lighter and a Zippo with me, a Bic and a Zippo with me. And I really don't taste the difference. There's not, you know, I mean, I think you can take the Pepsi challenge between a pipe, definitely a pipe lit with a match and a Bic, and you probably wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. As far as butane's concerned, it leaves no flavor, but I don't think it's any different from a Bic lighter. I'm sure there'll be people who argue with me, but I just don't see the difference at all. Yeah. What is the... What's in the Bic? Like what's the... Just a gas. It's like a, just a liquid that turns into a gas under pressure. Good lord. The flame on your Zippo almost touched your forehead. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. I don't get that high. I bet you your wick isn't as out as far as mine is. Probably. That's what I would guess, at least. No, yeah, I've, I've settled on the... Well, I'll use anything. Well, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, you're just trying to get a light. I mean, <laughs> if you're smoking a hookah, I mean, they just take a hot coal and just throw it on <laughs> yeah. top. Yeah. And it just heats the uh, the tobacco, really syrupy tobacco, through aluminum foil. They just stick hot coals on top of it and then purifies it through water, and that's what you smoke. You got that fruity taste, you know? Mm-hmm. But I've never, uh, it's been a long time since I used a hook. I probably only used it twice or three times. Out with people or something? Yeah. I've been it's, in, a, it's a, it feels like you did it in college. Yeah. I've it's been, always in college. Well, I've been in many college apartments where there's a burn stain on the carpet from the hookah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hookahs are fine, I guess. You know, I mean, I'm not... Uh, it's neither here nor there, you know. For me personally. I mean, I can... It's like smoking an aromatic. But yeah. it's been cooled through water. And then the hose... You know, usually the hose runs about four foot, so... Yeah. It's definitely cool by the time it gets to you and runs to the water, you know. I guess that'd be the only, like positive of a hookah is you, you know, you're not going to get any tongue bite, you're not going to get any, um, yeah, basically just that, it's not going to, you're not going to make it where you can't taste anything the next day. Right. Well, it's definitely going to, it's probably definitely going to tame the tobacco a little bit if it's having to be ran through water, etc. <laughs> yeah, that too, I mean. It'd be interesting if you took a non-aromatic tobacco and tried to hook it up. Mm-hmm. You know. Take some haunted bookshop to a hookah. <laughs> I don't know if the hookah could handle haunted bookshop. Probably not. Hmm. But, uh... Cold. Got a little cold. Mm-hmm. Temperature drops so quick. Sun goes away so fast, it's ridiculous. There's a lamppost over there that keeps flickering. I think uh, the bulb's dying on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, got a Stranger Things kind of feeling going on. 
If all the lights started shutting off heading towards us now, I'd be alarmed. Back in that movie. That, oh, yeah. that uh, what was it called? Ghost Stories. Yeah, man, that was creepy. Do you watch Ghost Stories? I watched that first part. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't watch the second or third story. That first one was creepy. That first one was hard to get through. I mean, yeah, I, str- I struggled. That's a struggle. That's, that's, there, you guys want to watch something kind of unnerving. I got first story in Ghost Stories is, it's legit. It'll, it'll get under your skin a little bit. It's three stories. It's three, yeah. Uh-huh. Really, the first story and the half of the second story is alarming. And then it sort of starts to, to wane. It's not as good after that. I did get into the second story, but it's getting really weird. When they, when they're in the, his house, mm-hmm. yeah, that's where it gets kind of. That, that bothered me a little bit, and then like, yeah, then it sort of falls to pieces after that. Martin Freeman's in the third act, isn't he? Mm-hmm. He sure is. Well, I figured he was because I didn't get to the third act, but I hadn't seen him yet. So I was like, well, mm-hmm. well you know, I guess he's in the third part. Um, yeah, that is a good one. Check it out. I think it's on Amazon Prime mm-hmm. or Prime Video. So if anybody, if you have that, check that out. Um, Definitely worth a watch. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> what? None. Just, just whistling this pipe, just whistling a little bit. Whist- whistle while you smoke. Mm-hmm. There you go. Well, again. I said if you'd uh, like to leave us some comments, you know. Definitely take them under advisement. Mm -hmm. We're basically just a level with you. We basically want an excuse to just sit around and smoke and talk. So if you can give us any kind of stuff uh, that you may be interested in and want to hear people talk about. Because that's how I am. I mean, sometimes I just want to I'm riding around, I want to hear people's opinion on things. Even if there's opinions I don't agree with, I want to be able to have that internal argument with them <laughs> while I'm driving down the road. Oh, you, that's completely wrong, and this is why you're wrong, and you know, I'm the only talking to myself. <laughs> that, I mean, I, I like that, I enjoy that, and, and with the rise of um, talk radio, podcasts, YouTube stuff, it seems like a lot of people are into that. Just want to hear opinions, and, and, and reviews, and stuff like that, so... Whatever y'all... You think it's difficult to? for people to develop opinions of their own? Is, and that's why they listen to other people's opinions? Just a question. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm only speaking on me. Most of the time... I don't listen to other people's opinion to form my opinion, but to sharpen my opinion. Gotcha. i noticed over the years that people who never had an opinion over anything... Now in my 30s, they're like, do you listen to Rush Limbaugh? Do you listen to Alex Jones? Do you listen to Bill Maher? Like, all of a sudden, they're really into talking heads. And I was like, wow, you never even said you had an opinion on politics or religion or whatever. Where is this coming from? They're like, well, just like, you know, listening to these characters have kind of opened my eyes to things. And I sort of listen to them kind of informally. Like, you know, sometimes I'll see something... You know, just getting into the bottomless pit of YouTube or something like that. I'll see a clip here or there, but I never really seek out those types of individuals uh, to listen to because I don't really care what they have to say. I do listen to, like, tobacco reviews. I like to hear what the YouTube community has to say about pipes and tobacco, Mm -hmm. but don't particularly get my information from YouTube as far as opinions at large. I mean, I'll listen to some things. Every once in a while, I might mention something, but it seems like the most <laughs> like, vapid, shallow folks I know from back in the day, now they're just like, well, such and such said, and it's like, I don't care what he said. Like, what do you think? Well, such and such said. 
It's like, well, that really haven't changed much, except now you're just spouting off whatever, uh... Now you're, all of a sudden, you're interested. You know, well, you're, you're interested enough to remember somebody's opinion. There's a weird thing that happens between 22 and 26, where, like, you really start to, uh shore up your ideas with others and then you start to get into that team building in politics or religion or philosophy or whatever uh-huh. and now all of a sudden you're a part of this team and then that team is what sort of sets the stage for the way you believe for the net and at least at least until you're 30 like you want to yeah you want to <laughs> you basically want to be a part of a label even if that label is i don't like labels you, you know, that's sort of what it seems like. Uh, maybe I was... Maybe I was pretty lucky, because... I'm a kind of... I believe in, um, you know, in, in generalizations and, and things like that. But I've always been so case, case by case mm-hmm. that I can't... I mean, I can agree with someone's opinion, but, and I can, and, you know, I can, my opinion can be changed when strong points are made, and I can't c- combat it, but, you know, it's always just sort of been like, you know, yeah, that, that's an opinion, and I agree with it, there you go, you know, but, it's never really been like a, well, this person said this, so now I'm changing my opinion, or I never had an opinion, now I've heard his opinion, now all of a sudden I do have an opinion. I don't know, I've just never, never been into that. Hmm. Now, a lot of times, I will say, it's a fault of my own. If I don't particularly like a person and they say something, I might not like that opinion. Even if I don't have an opinion on it, on the topic, they make an opinion. It's hard for me to sort of like that opinion, just because I don't like that person. Well, but that's more on a personal level. That's not on a, topping, a talking head level. That's why they say don't meet your heroes, uh, Mm -hmm. because they are going to affect the way you think about them for the rest of your life. And that goes as far as, like, that's why I don't really like to know about the personal life of actors, uh, because of their unsavory. I have a tendency to dislike the films they're in. Yeah, I'm... (laughs) I'm sort of on the other end of that. I'm like... I tend to not let anything outside of an act like an actor's performance or a musician's performance affect it. And I usually get into heated arguments over that where, you know, somebody be like, well, I ain't going to go see that movie. Uh, You know, this, this, that, and the other. I'm like, well, this guy did this or this girl supports this. I'm like, is any of that in the film? Honestly, you know. But I don't go out looking for it. The only person I've ever actively gone out and seek was Vince Vaughn, just because I like Vince Vaughn so much. Mm-hmm. Well, I did when I was younger. I was pretty happy, too, because he's sort of thinks the way I do. So. Mm. so, I guess it's kind of nice <laughs> when they are exactly what you expected. Yeah. Well, what was funny is I just wanted to know more about him, not necessarily his beliefs on certain things. I just wanted to, you know, I was just interested in it, you know? I just was like, you know, you know, and I just stumbled upon it, and I was like, oh, well, that, that's pleasant to know, mm. you know? That's very, uh, I'm happy I found that out. But, uh... That's good. I mean, it's always nice when, like I said, you come upon something that's at least positive, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, typically, it's so negative, especially right now yeah like uh i think a lot of my favorite actors probably couldn't survive the climate that we're in right at this moment uh i guess probably because some of my favorite actors are probably womanizers if you really get down to it like uh jack nicholson i think is and uh warren Beatty, you know and like those guys yes well spacey his career no. tanked because of it. Yeah. <laughs> because of his sexual predatory nature, you know. But, I I don't know. I can't, you know, I'm not, I don't want to like badmouth 
my favorite guys like Jack Nicholson and stuff. I just know that they were, I think he was pretty notorious for cheating on uh, Angelica Houston. Mm. Um, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, he was. But I mean, you know, I mean, uh, you know, that's who he was. He, he made some yeah. great films. So, I mean, some of my favorite movies star him, you know. That's the thing. You can be appreciative of a of a person's work, not appreciative of their uh, of, of their uh, personal life, right? And how they carry themselves. You can't. You can't. Hurt, you know. I don't really like Bill Belichick, the the um, head coach of the New England Patriots, but that don't stop him from being the best NF, one of the best NFL coaches. Um, I I don't really like Tiger Woods a lot. He, I'm I like more of the humble athletes, I guess. And Tiger Woods didn't really seem that way to me. People might get upset about that, but I'm still I can't deny he's one of, if not the best golfer that ever lived. So I mean I, I'm not gonna. I, I, and this sort of shows my <laughs> my uh, upbringing here. I I lived in a household that watched NASCAR. But I grew up not liking Dale Earnhardt, and but I can't deny that he was he was one of the best drivers too. But yeah. you know, so it's just one of the things you you can you can enjoy and appreciate the effort and the talent that someone has uh, without really caring about them. Yeah, I mean that's that's definitely true. You know, sports. It does. Uh, they sport a lot. They sport a lot. <laughs> Before we get into sporting and sporting things, I will say it is harder. Before we get into it, I'm not going to be commenting at all. So, well, before we get into your <laughs> evaluation of that, I'm gonna I'm gonna tiptoe back to old Spacey. It is hard now, and I hate it. It is hard to go back and watch like House of Cards, uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, um, uh, Usual Usual Suspects. Uh, if you ever want to try to watch Baby Driver, uh, um, it is harder to watch and not be aware of it. And like, dang, you know, cause there's some great performances. It's just minus Baby Driver. I mean, like, you know, I mean, I think people they, they do ask that question if, like, you know, if if uh, the career that is. You know, objectively has nothing to do with a man other than or a woman uh, being involved with the performance uh, that's kind of a complica- complex kind of scenario because it does have a lot to do with them but it doesn't but I mean is the performance objective that would be the question you know and can you separate the man and the and the art or the man and the performance or whatever it is uh, you know I mean, there are tons of of great people who have done unsavory things, mm-hmm. uh, things that we definitely wouldn't agree with in this society. I mean, people think of uh, Julius Caesar in kind of a high-minded way, uh, but I mean, Rome condoned sa- slavery, which is super no-no nowadays Mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the bondage of a human uh life you know but that's who you're saying was great he was a great leader yep but he also condoned slavery Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean that's just that's the way that republic empire was ran so you know i mean you kind of have to take the good with the bad i think and you know understand that like you know while there are uh character characteristically great moments there are also because they're being a human negative ones so which i think we took we we touched on this when we were talking about lovecraft in one of our episodes Mm -hmm. um but yeah you know yeah we're we're humans you know oh yeah it's i mean we're not gonna we're not gonna get it right every all the time well not every time that's for sure the thing is, is like, you know, the most human thing you can do is to err, uh, but the most exceptional thing as a human you can do is to forgive and to rise above. Mm-hmm. 
Wow, that is like the cheesiest line ever. But I mean, it's true. Yeah. You know, because like it is not within my nature to want to forgive or to rise out of something that I know to be wrong, but is in in kind of a part of my personality to be aware that what you did was wrong and to kind of try to overcome it. Uh, that's that's a, that's exceptional. I think. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I have gotten to the end of my bowl. What about you? Um, yeah, I'm about there. Well, it's been a good week. We hope to hear from you guys uh, over the weekend and during next week. And uh, we will catch you next time. All right. This has been a Pipecast production. And we hope to see you at the next Full Bowl.